The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today uh, for our presentation, uh, Docket Alarm Litigation in Light of COVID-19. Uh, before we get started, we do have a couple of quick housekeeping announcements. The first announcement is that you might have noticed that you're currently in listen-only mode. This is to ensure that everyone can hear during the presentation and that there's not a lot of background noise. Uh, you are welcome to and encouraged to ask questions during this, today's presentation. To do so, there is a questions button on your GoToWebinar pop-up. You can enter any questions that you have into that uh, GoToWebinar pop-up, and we'll work on answering them during today's presentation, as well as during the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. The second announcement is that uh, you today's session is not for CLE credit. It is an information session, um, and there will be a recording available if you're interested in hearing the session. All right, so with that, uh, let me go ahead and introduce our presenter for today. Uh, our presenter is going to be Michael Sander, the founder and managing director of Docket Alarm. Michael? Thank you very much, Anne. Um, thank you all for joining today. Uh, today, we're going to be going um, over class action lawsuits in light of COVID-19. There's quite a few that are going on, and um, there's quite a lot of activity that's happening. Uh, very quickly, just a brief, very brief intro. Uh, a little bit about myself and Dr. Norm and Fastcase. Um, I, in a previous career, I was actually an engineer, then went to, uh, into law, became an intellectual property attorney. And while I was an intellectual property attorney, I started developing tools um, to help track and analyze lawsuits across the country. Uh, those tools turned into a product called Docket Alarm, um, which over the next several years uh, grew to support a number of large law firms across the country. And in 2018 was purchased by Fastcase, which is a leading provider of legal research tools across um, for attorneys across the country. All right, so <clears throat> Docket Alarm has four main functions, tracking cases, searching for cases, litigation analytics, and an API. Um, today, um, we're really going to be focusing on a little bit more substance, um, but I wanted to just kind of give a sense of what this, this presentation is not. Um, this is not going to be a complete survey of coronavirus cases. It's not specific guidance for a business or a firm. Um, but the goal really here is to show practical tools that allow you to dig into legal data. And we're going to show you how to use those tools and as well as, um, as some of the data that you can pull out and some of the insights you can gain. And hopefully you can gain some insights that can be relevant to your practice. Um, just an outline of what we're going to be talking about today. First, uh, we're going to do a recap of some standing orders that um, I discussed in the previous few weeks. This will just take a minute or two. Uh, another is another topic we're going to be talking about. This is also going to just take a few minutes. Uh, a recap slash update of the litigation analytics that we did last week. Uh, I'll go over what litigation analytics are in just a few minutes. Um, then finally, we're going to, oops, it's tight. <laughs> it's not tight, but here. We're going to be going over more COVID-19 lawsuits, but specifically, we're going to be going over class action lawsuits. That's our focus of the day today. Uh, only class action lawsuits, all the new class action lawsuits that are being filed across the country. Um, and uh, the diversity in which they are being filed is pretty, is pretty impressive. Uh, so we're going to be going over quite a few of those. Um, just a quick recap on standing orders. Uh, one of the things that many attorneys don't realize is that Courts generally post their standing orders as docket sheets. Um, it's normally a docket is something that's used for uh, containing case information. Um, but it turns out that when courts are issuing standing orders, they actually issue them as a new docket. They fashion them as a new lawsuit. Um, and you can actually find these uh, standing orders. Let me just load up a screen very easily. Um, so we can just do a quick search for them. And it's just the idea here is just that it's very uh, straightforward to find standing orders um, that relates to COVID-19. You just type the standing order. I put in quotes. That makes sure that we look for the phrase standing order. And you'll see quite a few standing orders come up. Um, we've actually taken the liberty of, at least in some jurisdictions, marking down these standing orders. And we did this last week. We have not updated this. So this is as of, um, I think, March uh, April 2nd. 
Uh, the point is that a lot of these courts are issuing multiple standing orders in a single day, um, and it's changing from day to day. So to keep up to date on what's going on in these courts, uh, it can be extremely helpful with access to a doctor research product that can actually tell you every single thing that is happening there. Um, courts often do post this information on their website. Uh, they do often post it, uh, send out email alerts on it. Um, however, the original information that where it actually lives is inside the document sheet. Um, and it's not just in the Southern District of New York. That was just one example. Uh, there are many, 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 every jurisdiction has got a number of standing orders practically across the country at this point. Um, they range from, you know, continuing all hearings to doing some uh, hearings telephonically. Um, it really does depend very much on the jurisdiction that you're in. State courts are different than federal courts. Um, there's no one rule. So really, the rule is uh, stay up to date on the court that you're actually working in because the rules change literally every day. Right now. Um, just a little bit on continuances. Uh, obviously, this is also a recap from previous weeks. Um, continuances, many cases are getting continuances. Um, there's a lot of information out there on what type of continuances are being allowed and what types are not. Uh, in previous weeks, we actually went over a few cases where continuances were being del delayed or denied, excuse me, uh, because the, the coronavirus epidemic was not serious enough in a particular part of the country. Uh, at this point, though, we have not been seeing those anymore. Um, at this point, you know, pretty much every single part of the country is affected. So uh, pretty much every single continuance. We haven't found another look. We haven't found another continuance that's been denied um, uh, as a result of coronavirus, um, really. Um, so, uh, the next that kind of covers our first recap of the last few weeks on continuances and standing orders. Uh, another quick uh, update to last last week's talk was on uh, how can we use litigation analytics to uh, kind of see a top level picture of what's going on across the courts uh, in the country. And last week we actually focused on criminal cases, uh, federal criminal cases, and we were trying to determine how often motions for release to custody were occurring. Um, across the federal judiciary, uh, as you know, you know a lot of a lot of criminal defendants are in uh, jail awaiting a, uh, awaiting a trial, um, or maybe near the nearing the end of their um, sentence. Uh, and as a result, a lot of their attorneys are filing motions for release of custody uh, on compassionate grounds reasons um, and a variety of other uh, legal reasons to actually release someone early or uh, lower the bail costs. Um, and we built a set of analytics uh, to do this, um, and I can show you a lot of the data. Again, we went over this in detail last week, but I would do a quick update, um, and I just want to show you these are the motions for release from custody due to COVID-19. And you know, what's nice is that last week we, we kind of pulled the data. I think we pulled it on April second, um, so we kind of only got you know the first two thirds of this graph. Uh, but you can see a clear pattern of increasing um, increasing motions being filed uh, over time. Uh, and the, the, you know, clearly no one's filing these things on the weekends. You can see the clear gap on the Saturday and Sundays where no motions are being filed. Um, just a quick note about this data. Uh, we pulled this data using a randomized sample of criminal cases. Um, so while the absolute numbers are probably not, uh, are, are not really meaningful, um, the, uh, the, the trend is really what we're trying to show here, the increase in these motions over time, that is meaningful. And you can see uh, as time goes on, we, you know, we can expect this trend to continue uh, an upwards trajectory. Uh, we pulled this data yesterday around um, 11 a.m. So that's why uh, you don't see much on the 9th. Um, so uh, that, that's really what's going on. So really the, the interesting thing about DACA, you can use it to find these standing orders. You can use it to find uh, kind of get this high level information on uh, what's going on in criminal cases. You can do the same thing for civil cases. Uh, today, we want to really talk about class actions um, and how do you use a tool like DACA to find class actions, what type of class actions are going on, uh, what information is available uh, in the dockets um, as far as class actions go. So we have a few different areas uh, that we're going to be discussing. Um, one is just, first of all, how to find class action lawsuits. Uh, normally, you know, if you're an attorney in the class action space, um, you might have paralegals that are doing this research, uh, or you, you know, talk to your attorneys, or you know, if you're not quite in the, uh, uh, you talk to your colleagues, excuse me, um, to see who's filing what, uh, or you look to news sources that will, uh, you know, publish publish new class actions. Um, 
The nice thing about docket alarm is because we're hooked into the dockets directly, you can very easily find class actions within a system with a docket system like this. And we'll, I'll show you how to do this. Um, and then we're going to go over these recent class action lawsuits. Uh, so you can see some of the new filings that are coming in in light of COVID-19. There's quite a few. Uh, and uh, there's quite a few, and uh, we'll go over some of them. I kind of broke them down into categories to make it easier to process. Um, all right, so just let's see, how, do, how does one go out and find class action lawsuits? Uh, there's no flag uh, that the you know, plaintiffs uh, who bring a class action lawsuit really you know, check off uh, to show that, hey, this is a class action lawsuit. Um, they're fashioned and styled in many different ways uh, so there's kind of, we kind of break it down into different ways of how to find these based on the way that they're fashioned and styled within the court. Sometimes um, uh, the easiest way to find a class action lawsuit is just to search for complaints that have the word class action complaint in them. And I'll go over how to do that in a second. Uh, sometimes it's not so simple. You can't just do that. Uh, you have to find them within the uh, docket sheets. And it's important to realize that some class actions are styled as one docket sheet with many thousands of parties. When other class, class actions, uh, there are thousands of dockets uh, and are kind of all related to each other. So there's, depending on how these uh, cases are going to be fashioned, there will be different ways of searching for them. All right, so let's just go over the easy one first. Now, the easy one is just to do a, oops, is just to do a search. Um, I'll just do it right now so we can see it. You can use this filter. Uh, we can just look for the words COVID-19. And then over here, we can look for the words pleading. Uh, so now we're looking for all the pleadings that mention COVID-19, and then we can say something like class action. And then immediately, all the pleadings that mention COVID-19, class action, they come right up. Uh, this is probably by far the easiest way of getting, um, uh, of getting uh, new cases, class action cases. Uh, some of these will not be class action lawsuits. It depends on the, um, you know, it might be mentioned saying the word class action, uh, but a lot of them, a lot of them definitely are. So you can see, uh, you know, this the first one right here definitely is. The second one is, I mean, actually, these are some, some of these cases we're actually going, we're going to be going over uh, in, in, in substance in just a few minutes. Um, so that's one way of finding them. Uh, another way of finding them is by looking not inside the pleadings, but by looking for the docket sheets. Um, in some cases, there are uh, the, the way that you can tell a class action is a class action is if there's just many, many plaintiffs. If there's 200 plaintiffs or 1,000 plaintiffs in a case, very likely it's a class action. I mean, it can be styled that way. So we have actually a way of, of finding cases that way. Um, you know, you can do a search. You know, the search we have up here is a date filter, and it's looking for words COVID-19 or coronavirus. And then this is a very interesting search that we have. It's only really, I've only seen it on Dr. Alarm. We can actually find cases that have more than a certain number of parties. Let's show you how to do that. So let's just say this. We're going to have the COVID-19 coronavirus over here. And we're going to look for cases that have a number of parties. Uh, and we're looking only for people, cases that have more than 50 parties. Um, and so we can normally set a, uh, we use this num party filter here. Um, and we can set, you know, between 50 and 1,000 parties, say. Um, and, or you can just leave the 1,000 blank and you can get rid of these pleadings. I'm going to remove that filter. Okay, and there's quite a few, <laughs> so as you can see. Um, let's put a date filter on this so that we uh, only are looking kind of for recently filed cases. So I'm going to put like 3 1 2020 into that box. And um, here we get our other set of cases. So here we're only finding cases that have mentions COVID-19 or coronavirus uh, and have between 50 and 1,000 parties involved in the case. Um, these are not necessarily class action lawsuits, but it's very likely that they are. Uh, so, and also sorry, the other filter that we added was that they were filed um, from March 1st, 2020. Uh, so this is yet another way of finding, uh, of finding uh, class action lawsuits when there's one case with many parties. Let's just click on one of these cases so you get to see. Okay, so here there's actually a lot of defendants, but uh, this is this is uh, definitely a large action filed against many different defendants. I, I saw another one right after this was a class action. 
Um, but what we're looking here for is, you know, there's more than 50 parties involved in this case, uh, and you can easily find those um, using these types of tools. Uh, the third way of finding class actions is to use analytics. Um, this is especially useful uh, to find cases where there are many different lawsuits launched against the same parties, so there's separate lawsuits uh, where, you know, one party is the defendant. Um, and I kind of went through these analytics. These are basically, these are analytics we were using from a few weeks ago um, to just find COVID-19 lawsuits. And then we just looked at the top parties. And you can see Ethicon over here in Johnson & Johnson. Uh, they have 15 cases that mention COVID-19. And it turns out that these, um, these cases are indeed class action lawsuits. Uh, so they're just styled in a way that, you know, there's um, 15 different lawsuits rather than one lawsuit with uh, a class full of 15 people. Um, so it really depends on how the, uh, these class actions are styled and depends on uh, that that influences how you actually find the cases. Um, so that's kind of how I went back and found all these cases. Um, and I'm going to kind of go through that process a little bit more uh, just to show you again how this works. Um, but with those tools in, in place, I were actually able to start looking for them. So uh, what type of class actions are we talking about today? One this is the Zoom case. Uh, we're actually going to go through this in a little bit of detail just because it's been in the news. Um, there's been many articles written about it. Uh, and there's actually many different class actions that have been filed about against Zoom. Um, we're going to be talking about one in particular. Um, then there's cases against different government entities. Uh, we'll be going over three different class action lawsuits involving government uh, government entities. Uh, and then there's uh, another section of, that we're going to be talking about on refunds. There's one of the RRD, the class actions on refunds and cancellations. Um, for various industries, we'll talk about that. And then finally, just a few more if we have time. Um, I wanted to be done by uh, 1240, um, so Eastern time. So we'll see if we get to, we get through all these, but we'll, uh, we'll do a few more. Um, so first, we're going to be talking about the Zoom privacy class actions. All right, so uh, there are actually multiple Zoom cases um, that have been filed. Uh, there are we found six different class actions that are going on. Um, raising claims, um, a lot of tort law claims, a lot of uh, the CCPA is a California uh, Consumer Protection Act claim, there's SEC claims, um, there's also outside of civil litigation, and there's FTC investigation, and multiple attorney general investigations. Um, so actually, just backing up a little bit further, for those who are not familiar with Zoom, um, which I assume many people on this call are, it's a video, um, a video conferencing app that has grown significantly in popularity. Uh, over the past, you know, few months or a few weeks, really, um, it's uh, was already popular before. Uh, but due to a number of a number of issues, privacy and other issues, um, they, they have been subject to quite a few lawsuits uh, since COVID nineteen has taken off. Um, so just to find all these cases, how do we find them? Use a search query I used. Uh, we're only looking for cases from uh, March first, twenty twenty. Um, I use this little is docket filter here to try to find only only docket cases. Uh, then we're looking for cases where the name of the, of the party is Zoom and they are defendant. Let me just show you how, I, how you can go and type that in and do it. Uh, we can go to our advanced search builder here. So we're only looking for cases that involve Zoom, where they are defendant. And we're not interested in the documents. We just want dockets only. Let me do a search. <clears throat> Um, these are going to be all cases where Zoom is a defendant. So let's let's kind of move uh, forward a little bit um, and only look for again cases from 3 1 2020. Okay, now there's eight. So the number's actually gone up since I last saw this. Um, but uh, I looked at it yesterday, I believe. Um, but there's quite a few. I've gone through most of these. We're going to be talking about this case, Drew v. Zoom Communications. Uh, I've gone through pretty much all of these, um, except for the very newly filed ones. Uh, but this, this particular case seems to have um, kind of the most uh, involved. It's, probably, it's the most um, uh, it's kind of sophisticated complaint in many ways, listing a lot, quite a few different causes of action um, uh, and uh, and kind of support supporting information. Um, let's just take a look at the the firm. Uh, Pomerantz, or Pomerantz, based in Los Angeles, they're the ones who brought this. Um, let's just quickly see if Zoom video, nope, they do not have counsel announced yet. I saw it in the previous case, I believe they were using Cooley as a, as a uh, defense counsel. Um, so let's just take a look at this complaint, what it, what's in here. Um, so I just pulled up the complaint. 
Uh, it's the one that we just saw right down here, um, class action complaint. But uh, so I'm just going to, instead of looking at the raw document, I think we're just going to take a look at some excerpt, excerpts to see what's going on in this case. Um, so Zoom is a, private, is a web uh, video conferencing app. Um, and this particular case involves a lot of privacy uh, violations that have been going on. Um, and kind of the crux here is that Zoom had significantly overstated the degree to which its video communication software was encrypted. Uh, and basically the security involved in this. Um, and if it was just one issue that was involved in Zoom, a lot of people think that, oh, it's, they've heard of one issue or two issues maybe. There's actually many different issues that Zoom has. It's not just one particular issue. Um, so oh, also what's interesting here, just at least the, the grounds in which they're bringing them, these, these are SEC claims, these are securities claims, these aren't tort law claims. Some of the other cases have tort law um, and, uh, and actually cause of action based purely in privacy statutes. Um, but these, these, this particular case is purely an SEC um, uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so here's uh, basically one of the issues that, they, uh, that, they're, that they're, they're alleging in this complaint. Um, in July 8, 2019, so well before the coronavirus um, pandemic began, uh, security researcher Jonathan Leitch, uh, Leitch, uh linked an article published by him to, to that page to his Twitter account, which allegedly exposed a flaw allowing hackers to take over Zoom webcams. According to the article, uh, the Mac Zoom client allows any malicious website to enable your security your camera without permission, and the flaw potentially exposes up to 750,000 companies around the world that use Zoom to conduct day-to-day -day business. Basically, you could spy on, uh, there was a security flaw. One issue is that there was a security flaw that allowed any hacker to spy on anyone's video camera um, that was in their home if they had the Zoom app installed. Not a very good thing. Uh, that's not the only thing, though. <laughs> um, in addition, uh, the Zoom's privacy policy does not make clear that the iOS version of Zoom app is sending some analytics data to Facebook, even if Zoom users don't have a Facebook account. If you've downloaded Zoom, some of your data is being sent to uh, face, Facebook, um, probably due to, due to some partnership. Actually, that's what the allegations say. That there is a partnership between Zoom and Facebook. Um, it doesn't provide uh, all the details on the user, but it does provide the user's device information, such as the modem and see the connecting form um, that the phone carrier they're using and a unique advertiser identifier uh, created by the user's device, which company can use to target what the user with advertisements. Basically, Zoom, if you use Zoom, it, you make, you're making Facebook's uh, advertising system a little bit better. Um, and this was not clear in the privacy policies. That was yet another violation, uh, or another allegation that they're, that they're bringing um, uh, in this case. Uh, and then there's yet another, another issue. Uh, a lot of Zoom's marketing claims that they are what's called end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, that's, that's a term that they're using. Um, and the complaint here alleges that Zoom's video conferencing software is not, in fact, end-to-end -end encrypted. End-to-end -end encrypted has a particular meaning. Uh, it's a particular meaning. Um, it, it means something a little bit more than just uh, just encryption is used. Uh, it means that the first people in the middle um, do not have access to it. So, if an end-to-end -end encryption system, if uh, we're using a video conference that was end-to-end -end encrypted, let's say what we're using, I think, a uh, go-to webinar, for example, um, that would mean that you know I can see the presentation. Uh, the folks in the webinar can see the presentation. But if it's end-to-end -end encrypted, that means that GoToMeeting itself or GoToWebinar itself cannot see um, cannot see the the, the contents. Uh, and that's what Zoom had claimed in their marketing, but in fact, it's not actually the case. They can see uh, the substance and the contents of all of your meetings if they need to. Um, so that's yet another allegation. Um, so this is really uh, quite you know a hefty complaint. There's a lot of allegations in here. Um, one can imagine that there'll be a lot of other a lot of coordination with some of these other cases um, that uh, we have involved in Zoom. Let's just go back to them. I think um, I believe some of these others, I, I took, took a look at this Johnson one. Uh, this Johnson case is much more of a uh, tort law uh, style case um, and BAMS as well. Uh, this is another securities case. So there's, there's quite a few here that are going to be probably uh, merged or working together um, to kind of bring together a large case against Zoom. Um, oh. Oh, excuse me. And then I forgot the last uh, allegation in here. Uh, right, the CEO um, of of Zoom uh, also dumped 38 million. This is uh, this is the SEC hook. Uh, recently dumped 38 million dollars of the company's stock ahead of the investigation of the security breaches at the video conferencing company. 
Um, you know, I'm sure they're going to be alleging intent here uh, at some point, um, but it could be part of the normal course of the, of the CEO of selling shares, and that will be investigated as part of the security investigation. Um, so that's, that kind of brings us to Zoom. I hope you have a nice update on kind of the broad outlines of the issues that are going on there. Uh, we can certainly expect those to develop. I wanted to go over some government class action lawsuits. Uh, we found three of them at least, and I know actually we're talking about three of them. I know of several more uh, that are going on, um, but let's just talk about one in particular is about the U.S. government class actions. Um, so the plaintiffs in this case uh, are employees of the United States of America, the of the federal government, um, and the plaintiffs here actually represent quite a few different agencies. Uh, there's the Food Aid Safety and Section Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Bureau of Prisons of the U.S. Department of Justice, um, and uh, there was actually a few more that are alleged in this complaint. So we can think of this case um, just to see who's actually bringing this uh, uh, who's bringing this lawsuit. Pop the link into here. Quick look. Oh, here's the complaint, and then we just go to view the docket sheet. Again. And it's going to be grasping the information just a second. Um, whoop, and we just did a pull up tape from, uh, from Pace right there. Um, so this is the firm, it's a firm based out of Washington, D.C., um, and uh, they're bringing this case. Uh, so this is a case that's representing basically all of the workers in the federal government. And they're bringing it on claims of um, a particular uh, section of the U.S. Code. Um, there, there are regulations uh, that change the, um, the the compensation of federal workers uh, with, with, with that, that pay differentials for uh, duty involving severe working conditions or unusually severe hazards. And the, the allegations really here are that you know, a lot of these, uh, these these workers were forced to, were asked to continue to work as essential service providers, and they should be in it should be entitled to an additional pay um, for severe working conditions or severe hazards, uh, and they haven't received that. So th that's what this lawsuit is is all about. Um, but also seeing not just federal government allegations, uh, there are also state government class action lawsuit. Um, this is a, uh, a case against the Texas State Department of Criminal Justice, um, and. This one is uh, really targeting not not federal state, state workers, uh, but state detainees, um, prisoners across the state. Uh, this is, this case is actually kind of notable. It was bought by a very um, high end law firm, Winston and Strawn. Uh, very likely a pro bono case. Um, there's some serious irony in this case. Really, uh, this the issue here was that the prisons were not um, providing proper safety equipment to the prisoners uh, and they haven't actually implemented a lot of uh, policies that were recommended by the CDC. Um, so while the, the, the prison system has implemented a uh, policies in response to COVID-19 pandemic, these procedures are woefully inadequate and do not comport with many of the CDC's recommendations. Um, and this is the irony here. Uh, and ironically, the inmates have been pressed into manufacturing alcohol-based sanitizer, um, but they are not allowed to use it. So the, the inmates, they're forcing inmates to manufacture the necessary protective measures, preventative measures, but they are prohibited from using it themselves. Imagine making hand sanitizer all day long and then not being able to use it. Uh, it can be a serious frustration for, for many inmates. Um, and there's, this lawsuit kind of revolves around that. And then the other safety uh, standards that are not being fully enforced um, in Texas prisons. Uh, we could, I, I'm certain we can expect to see other claims like this uh, appear in other states. Um, then there's also foreign government class actions. We actually found multiple against the Chinese party, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, and the Chinese government themselves. Uh, this is a this was filed um, just two days ago, and uh, this one is a relatively small time case. There's there's bigger cases, there's smaller cases. It really does span the huge diversity of the types of lawsuits that are going on here. Um, and this one is uh it's actually has to do with the distribution of Equipment um, and uh, it's it, it coming in from China, and they actually sued the Chinese Communist Party for that. Uh, let's take a quick whoops. Look at this case. Pull this one out. Um, 
And let's just take a quick peek to see. I always like to look at who is filing these cases. Okay, it looks like a small firm in, um, in Boca Raton, Florida, uh, by attorney Matthew Moore. Um, so we can actually see uh, the uh, quite a few of other of these cases. Um, if you want to just take another quick look, uh, we can take a look for all the cases in which the Republic. I remember the China. I know. I know. The reason I'm searching for this is I know that there was at least another case uh, where China was um, sued in a class action style complaint. Or if they have, they were making a demand of a, of a billion dollars. Um, that, that's always fun. Um, yeah, here's here's another class action uh, involving the people. Oh, this one's actually older. Excuse me. Let's do a day search. Okay, again. Okay, there's quite a few in here. This is the one that we just pulled up. Uh, here, I believe, is the other class action that was filed a few weeks ago. <clears throat> we can take a look at that. Um, there's actually quite a few in here. Uh, so, oh, actually, now, now I'm seeing some, <clears throat> some other ones that I haven't even researched yet. Uh, there's quite a few. We can expect to see quite a few more. Um, here's another one that uh, just was filed two days ago. Um, so not all of these are COVID-19 related, but many of them match up, but many of them are. Um, and we'll see those continue. Uh, the next subject of cases where you know we're seeing a lot of other type of activity, not just against the government, um, is refund cases, or cancellation cases. Uh, and there's two of them that I'd like to talk about today. Um, one is the Boston Sports Club. Um, it's part of a larger organization called um, Town Sports. Uh, they own sports clubs in New York. San Francisco, lots of major cities uh, across the country. And um, the complaint alleges that Town Sports, uh, that back, back in mid March 2020, Town Sports closed all of its Boston sports clubs. It also furloughed or terminated nearly all of its Massachusetts based employees. However, Town Sports then shockingly and willingly continued to charge consumers monthly membership fees for services that it knowingly would not render. Um, this is pretty, pretty impressive that they would do this. Uh, this case was filed uh, April 5th. That was Monday, I believe, of this week. Um, and oh, was that actually on a Sunday? That was a Sunday that they filed this. Uh, so they filed this on Sunday, a class action complaint. Um, it took all of uh, four days. Um, so this was yesterday. Uh, yesterday morning, Age Boston Sports Club changed their policies. Um, so now Boston Sports Club, as of, as of yesterday, will now freeze all of the memberships. Um, and so I noted this only happened after the Massachusetts AG got involved. Uh, I think also very likely when they saw these class action lawsuits coming in as well. Um, actually, it's not even clear if they even know about this as well so recently. Um, so, you know, we're going to see this. This is not the only kind of cancellation slash refund case that's coming up. Uh, there's another large case involving um, United Airlines. This is a class action lawsuit. Uh, this has to do with the, the thousands of uh, Flight cancellations that are going on in the country right now, um, and uh, almost all airlines are allowing uh, providing uh, flight vouchers um, and refund vouchers so that you can rebook at a later time. This lawsuit is uh, basically, you know, alleging that, that that United is not offering monetary refunds to passengers with canceled flights, um, and they they have quite a bit of legal support to actually. Um, uh, try to make that claim. We'll see how this pans out. Uh, I'm sure that United has uh, plenty of language in their ticket contracts, allowing them to not give the monetary refunds that they don't need to. Um, but some of these cases can definitely play out in the court of public opinion, as we've seen in the uh, Boston Sports Club case. Okay. Um, so let's just take a quick peek at this one. I normally like to look and see who represents these companies. Every now and again, you'll get a uh, you know, famous attorney or a famous law firm. Um, pull this one up. All right. Oh, so here we're just looking at the complaints. And we can find the attorneys on the docket sheets. Ah, Hagen's Berman. Yeah, so pretty well known. So Hagen's Berman, for those who aren't familiar with them, they're very well known um, plaintiff's law firm specializing in, in you know, class actions and, um, and, you know, I think they do toxic tort as well, um, antitrust cases, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, they're making a looks like ten million dollar demand. Um, see how that one plays out. That's also pretty interesting. 
All right, so now to go to a little bit more of uh, some other fun ones, um, fun for some, painful for others. Uh, this is, I, I briefly touched on this case um, uh, two weeks ago, I think. Uh, there's, it's a case that's filed back on March 25th, which, you know, in these times actually feels like old news <laughs> about two weeks ago. Uh, so this case was, um, it's a quackery case. You don't really see very many of these, uh, especially, you know, but that as, in the pandemic, you know, one can imagine you see a little bit more of them. Um, so uh, this is a, morning, a case against Morningside Church Productions. Uh, which is a televangelist church um, slash mega church. Uh, the she, uh, the preacher is um, Jim Baker. I'm not sure if anyone on the call is familiar with him. Uh, but basically, the, the allegations are that um, on his show, on his televangelist show, he was marketing a product called Silver Solutions, uh, which is basically just water with uh, some silver. Uh, Silver mineral and it dissolves into it in very small concentrations um, and uh, kind of homeopathic remedies. Um, and uh, he, you know, on this show, he basically marketed the product as a cure all. Uh, this, this influenza that you're now, that's now stuck in the globe, you're saying that silver solution well, would be effective. Well, let's just say it has been tested on this strain of coronavirus, it's been tested on other strains of coronavirus and has been able to eliminate it within 12 hours. Baker, the, the preacher, Baker, yeah. Totally eliminated, kills it, deactivates it. Baker, yeah. Silver cell has been proven by the government that it has been the ability to kill every pathogen that's ever been tested on, including SARS and H1, which I think is H1N1, uh, short for that. So that's a pretty bold claim that they're making. Um, the truth, though, is a little bit uh, not, not quite as optimistic. Um, the CDC has said that consuming silver, so this is basically a silver, uh, I think it's silver phosphate. A silver salt or silver mineral. Uh, Considering silver is not safe or effective to treat any treat or prevent any ailments. No valid scientific studies exist that demonstrate that silver has any health benefits at all. Indeed, the National Institute of Health states that varietal silver, like silver solution, can be dangerous to people's health, and that there is no scientific proof that is effective to treat any disease or condition. So this is a completely snake oil that they're selling here, at least according to the allegations, um, and. Uh, and there's going to be a nice class action out of this one as well. Um, here's just the different counts that were bought. I just tried to pull, them out, pull out a few of the different counts. I haven't really seen a, a quackery case uh -huh, recently. So uh, just to kind of give people a, some background on what type of claims are being made here. Um, there's a warranty act. I don't know if this is a federal or state act. Uh, there's clearly a Missouri State Court Merchandising Practices Act um, uh, that's under state courts, uh, state law, uh, breach of warranty, which is pretty common. A breach of implied warranty, which is also another common um, yeah, common law uh, cause of action, fraud, which obviously doesn't make sense, and then unjust enrichment. So these are the kind of the claims that are being brought against Morningside Church Productions. Um, oh, there's one last. This is the last uh, the last one we'll be talking about today. Um, this one is uh, in Ray Jewel Labs. This is a case that was brought um, uh, quite a while ago. Actually, let's take a look and see when this was brought. This is a huge case. It up. And this one, when I was searching for pleadings that were involving um, COVID-19, okay, so this one was filed actually not that long ago, October 2019. Um, but this, this case has really very little to do with the class action lawsuit, has little to do with um, the uh, with, with COVID-19, at least originally. Um, but uh, this case is ongoing now. You can see that there's quite a bit of material that's already been filed in it. Um, but when I was doing that search, the search came up. Remember the search that we did, uh, we were searching for pleadings that mentioned COVID-19. Um, and there was actually a pleading in this case. The, 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 the attorneys in this case amended their complaint uh, to add additional information about COVID-19. So here's uh, their amended complaint. We can pull it up. There's uh, it's almost 300 pages long. It's a large class action complaint. Uh, but they now have a few paragraphs in here about uh, COVID-19. Um, so for those who are not familiar with Juul, Juul is an e-cigarette company uh, that uses vapor, liquid vapor, for, uh, to generate smoke rather, or rather than uh, you know combusting a cigarette. Um, they're being sued for their marketing practices to, to, to minors. Uh, so here, their, their amended complaint now contains uh, some additional paragraphs. Juul users are not all, are also at greater risk of suffering more serious complications. 
if they can contract the coronavirus. Um, so basically, they're trying to tie this case to COVID-19, I guess, in any way that they can. Uh, I'm not sure this really buys them much legally, uh, although, you know, every little bit they can get probably counts to some degree. Um, so that's kind of our quick review. There are many more class actions that I found that I'm not talking about. Uh, a lot of these class actions are also related. Um, there's, there's, it's some, actually, I even alluded to some class actions involving uh, some other startups uh, in my previous talks. Um, but feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to talk about any others. Um, just kind of overall conclusion takeaways here, uh, really that there's plenty of information in dockets. Um, this is where news reporters find their information. This is where uh, uh, attorneys go and find information about standing orders and what's happening in the court. Um, the class action activity has begun in earnest. You think that people would wait a few days or a few weeks, but you know, we see more and more of this every day. It seems like everybody's racing uh, to get these things in fi on file. Um, and then also really the other main takeaway here is this, this is a huge diversity in the types of actions being brought. I mean, we saw many class actions in the 2008 crisis, but um, that was really only affecting in certain sectors of the economy. Uh, COVID-19, you know, everything from airfare to uh, trading apps to video conferencing software, everything you can imagine is being affected. Um, so there's, it's very, you know, quite, quite large diversity in types of apps, uh, types of class actions that are going to be brought. Um, that's actually brings me right to the time um, on today's talk. Thank you all very much for joining. Uh, again, my name is Michael Sander. Um, you can reach me at michael at .com, or you can contact our, uh, our, our support um, our support team uh, who are happy to answer any questions about today's talk or about the products that you'd like to see. Um, if you'd like copies of these slides or links to any of these cases, please let us let me know. And with that, I will hand it back to Erin. Thank you, Michael. That was excellent. Um, just one question that came up from the audience. Um, and that question is, um, they did see the different types of, of uh, class actions that were being featured. They were wondering if you had seen any class actions directly featuring the American government, or if all of them were commercial entities or foreign governments or entities. Um, so I, I think I, there's three. Uh, cases just going back. Um, I kind of tried to show statistics diversity. Uh, in particular, we have this. The first case involves the federal government. Um, so the first case does involve federal government workers. Uh, the second case involves the state government, in that it's, it involves state uh, inmates that are being held by the state government. And then the third one involves you know foreign governments. Um, uh, in this particular case, China. Uh, for their role in spreading or inhibiting the epidemic um, from Bure. Um So there, there's there's a bit of each, <laughs> there, and I'd expect to, to see a little bit more in all for all of them. Excellent point. Looks like the follow-up clarification was: Do you see any uh, class actions forming regarding uh, testing or general treatment of COVID-19 in the general population, not just prison-related or um, foreign government-related? Uh, I haven't yet seen class actions to that degree. I have seen lawsuits, though. Um, we're going to be talking about, I, I wanted to try to do an IP-related web webinar. Um, IP is definitely lagging, but there was one case, it's almost a famous case, it got written up in uh, various news sources, where a testing lab was sued for patent infringement, amazingly, because it violated uh, some patents um, that, uh, it's a good case to talk about, I could talk about it for a while. Uh, but it was basically they were trying to shut down testing labs that were testing for COVID-19. Um, that's the that's the kind of the, the testing based litigation I found. Um, I believe I, I, I believe there is all of these to some degree have some element of testing related issues involved in them, like against the government cases. There's the government workers want to be tested and they're not able to be tested. Uh, they can't test any of their coworkers, so it's there's some there's allegations in that like you know they um, they're not properly do, they're not doing enough testing, so that that, that there's there's a hook in that to, to some degree, but I haven't seen um, you know like class actions alleging malfeasance by hospitals. Uh, I haven't seen that yet, um, yet, uh, but you know I, that that I'm sure is probably being gathered as we speak. Wonderful. Well, we'll definitely look forward to those further cases and the further discussion of them as we continue. 
All right. Well, I would like to thank everyone for joining us for today's session. Um, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you do have the contact information on the screen right now. And we hope that you'll join us for future webinars from FastCase and Docket Alarm. Have a wonder wonderful afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Donna. Bye.